So I'm Vera Tolz and I'm professor of Russian studies at uh, the University of, Man of Manchester and I'm uh, here at the university since 2004, so almost 20 years. I'm Stephen Hutchings, also professor of Russian studies at the University of Manchester and I've been here since 2006. It's fair to say that we have uh, complementary um, sort of interests and uh, expertise, uh, but uh, we have a shared interest in the role of the media in uh, sustaining um, authoritarian regimes. And as we are specialists of Russia, our focus is particularly on the Russian media. And I come to studying various topics relation, related to the use of uh, media um, in Russia from uh, the background of a historian and a historian who is uh, interested uh, specifically in the issues of uh, nationalism and national identity, ethnic relations. But also it's probably relevant uh, that uh, already a long time ago, in the 1980s and early 1990s, I worked as a researcher for actually a Cold War broadcaster, uh, Radio Liberty, and that kind of adds to my interest in how media function in the modern world and currently. I also uh for the past decade focused my attention primarily on, on uh, various aspects of the Russian media, but I began my career um, as a um, literature and film scholar. Um, and in that domain I developed technique skills, methods of close reading of texts, um, of which there is relatively little in, in, in within media studies. So. I think the two of us actually bring n new perspectives separately and in combination to a field that, that, that has been dominated by social science models that, that, um, uh, that promote primarily quantitative methods of analysis that, that are very good at certain things but which miss what we consider sort of key aspects of the of the topic we're both interested in. Um, the most recent project that we worked closely on uh, was one looking at the um, activities, audiences and significance of the Russian international broadcaster RT, um, which as you probably know has uh, been subject to various bans uh, following the Russia's invasion of, of, of Ukraine. Um, and. Um, RT has, 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 has been uh, linked very much with discourses of disinformation. It's seen as Russia's primary tool of disinformation in the, in the uh, international arena. Um, and, and so we studied RT as a tool of disinformation, but as, as we did so, we became increasingly dissatisfied um, and disillusioned and, 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 and frustrated by the way disinformation is, is studied in the main. Um, and we, we identified significant gaps in the coverage and mis misapprehensions and inconsistencies relating to what happens to disinformation when it crosses boundaries of language and culture, um, what happens to it across time, um, how different cultures, different geopolitical um, regions understand what disinformation is and the relationship between those understandings and the practices that we uh, count as disinformation. All of this is, tends to be kind of put to one side um, and taken as read under this sort of very reductive umbrella as, of, of disinformation as the negation of truth. Um, and whilst that lends itself quite well to these sort of big computer-driven um, uh, models of measurement and analysis, it, it really 
is blind to some of what we consider to be the, 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 uh, the really important uh, features of, 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 of this genuinely um, important threat to, uh, to, to our security. So it was that that led us to, um, uh, to, to launch a project that focused specifically on disinformation. The, the, the agenda for the new project attempts to address the, the gaps that I've, 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 I've just talked about. So it treats or attempts to treat disinformation not as a fixed objective phenomenon to be measured and quantified, but um, as a translingual, transcultural, discursive dynamic, um, uh, as uh, a concept whose history is, is, is very complex and muddled and has changed over time. So what is considered disinformation at one time is different from what is considered disinformation now, differs from context to context. So in, in one geopolitical domain, disinformation is aligned very much with what we would perhaps describe as, as, as propaganda. Um, in other domains, it, 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 it's separated out from propaganda. And so the inconsistencies in the usage of the term across time, across geopolitical domain, across cultural context, across audiences, from platform to platform, from media genre to media genre. So what might qualify as disinformation in a news report may not count as disinformation in, in an opinion piece. Um, these distinctions are not hair splitting. They're fine distinctions, but they're very, very important. Um, if you're going to take a systematic, methodical, uh, and proper scholarly approach to disinformation. So what, what we're going to try to do is to rectify those, um, those issues. Um, it's a very big, ambitious task, as you can imagine. So what we're going to try to do is, is to uh, limit ourselves to around six or seven key disinformation narratives. Um, all of which have been linked at one time or another to Russia, um, and then trace how those narratives arose, their provenance, which is not necessarily limited to, to Russia, how they travel, how the producers of those narratives amend and adjust them to take account of different audiences, the different senses and meanings that audiences in different arenas a tribute, and, and critically, um, the sort of looping process of mutual influence between concepts of what disinformation is and the practices that we label as disinformation. Uh, so it, 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 it's, a, it, it's a huge and ambitious project, but hopefully by focusing in on a discrete set of narratives um, that will enable us to in a way, take a snapshot on which uh, further research can be built in, in, in due course. But I, I, one thing I probably didn't say enough about was the historical yeah. dimension, which, which um, Vieira has already done a lot of uh, valuable work on. So. Yeah, we, uh, uh, again, in um, uh, our previous research, uh, we understood that kind of public discussions of disinformation uh, are kind of framed uh, still with uh, reference to the legacies of the Cold War. And uh, so uh, part of our project is to look at how uh, particular understandings of disinformation, discourses of disinformation, uh, have taken shape from the start of the Cold War to the present uh, in the context of basically intercultural communication uh, between uh, the key players in the Cold War, Soviet Union, Russia, 
and then Anglophone countries, uh, the United States uh, and uh, Britain, but also bringing in uh, kind of the impact of uh, disinformation and propaganda practices of Nazi Germany. So again, we have German within the team. Uh, and uh, also there was some interesting, very important uh, kind of historical uh, texts uh, on disinformation in the French uh, context. And basically this kind of discussion of what disinformation is, how to practice it, how to counter it, uh, that took place between different camps, two different camps in the Cold War, uh, this kind of legacy stays with us still and it's important to account for in how we're understanding this information today and this is the part of the project and I think really no one has done uh, a proper research on this historical uh, part before at all. So with the digital uh, uh, trust, uh, I mean, trust uh, is absolutely essential for maintaining imagined communities we live in. Uh, and uh, so uh, trust depends on having a shared uh, view of the world. And of course, media play enormous role uh, the communication sphere plays enormous role in shaping uh, people's worldview and the shaping kind of common perceptions necessary for maintaining bonds within community. And if we think, if we perceive that a lot of information, uh, or significant part of information uh, out there is misleading, uh, and moreover, there are basically competing misleading narratives uh, out there whose aim um, sometimes is to fragment societies, to split societies, not to unite them, then that uh, inevitably becomes an uh, enormous uh, problem. Now, in terms of security, again, if we look historically, um, disinformation as something which is practice, practiced by states in an organized manner in, uh, through specific departments within governments which uh, are set up to manipulate um, information. Uh, and we sort of this setting up of departments, this uh, particular new way of managing this information uh, as a tool of uh, uh, politics dates back to the First World War. And if we look at what happened during the First World War, how specifically disinformation was used by belligerent states, uh, Germany, uh, Britain was regarded as very, very successful um, um, kind of disinformation provider, a disinformation actor in that war, United States, uh, Russia, uh, and so on we'll see that uh, the main kind of disinformation as a weapon in war uh, was aimed at uh, particular ethnic minorities or other groups within the enemy society uh, which could be mobilized against its own state. So from the time uh, the kind of dis the users of disinformation uh, have taken the current form, sort of centralized, organized management at the government level. We see the use of disinformation as something which is supposed to undermine security, coherence, uh, ability to perform well of an enemy. Uh, but also what I, the point I would like to make, it's not only disinformation itself which is important for trust uh, in the digital age and before for security, but perception of disinformation. And what I mean here is that the worry and sometimes exaggeration of the ability of the enemy 
to use this information can be harmful for a particular society. And a good example, of course, is a Russian disinformation campaign in uh, the US elections of 2016. It's no doubt that uh, the Kremlin organized a disinformation campaign uh, with the purpose probably to um, support uh, Donald Trump's election. Uh, it's no doubt that it was the largest uh, disinformation campaign uh, of uh, kind of any time. Uh, but w what also uh, the best research and most of the research on the topic uh, about the impact of this campaign tells us that the actual influence of vote on vote in the United States of Russian disinformation ac uh, efforts was minimal. But what was important was the fear that the Russians interfere and uh, interfered and that somehow kind of undermined trust in the outcome of the elections. And so here we see that not just disinformation matters, but perception of disinformation also matters. Yes, I, I mean, there's a paradox that, 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 that Vera is, is, is describing that, that, that by which precisely because disinformation is a challenge uh, to, to trust and, and to democracy, particularly with the advent of digital forms of communication, um, it has generated a whole discourse of its own. You cannot, I challenge anyone to pick up a newspaper or watch a television news broadcast today where disinformation, misinformation does not make an appearance somewhere. It's everywhere. Uh, we're obsessed with it. Um, everywhere there are units looking to combat disinformation, there are fact checkers there are digital literacy programs, there are cyber security programs. We're awash with fear of, of disinformation and, and there are several dangers. Well, one is that of a kind of moral panic uh, that by overstating and inflating a genuine risk and threat you, you, you can actually hamper your ability to, to deal with it by actually sort of increasing mistrust to the point where people sense that disinform everything is disinformation and therefore we cannot trust a word anyone tells us. So in other words, the attempt to combat disinformation proves counterproductive and, and, and actually increases rather than decreases trust. But a related problem is that because of this rapid proliferation of discourse and activity, the field has not really had a chance to settle on definitions, to settle on understandings, to settle on just what we mean by disinformation. And if we understand what we mean by disinformation, what do we understand by truth? Um, as a result of which, these terms are banded around their inconsistently used and more worryingly still they're often kind of grouped together uh, within one kind of hazy overall kind of cloud a sense of this looming threat um, to which democracy is the answer uh, when in fact it's much more complicated than that and, 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 and much of what generates disinformation comes from within is inherent to democracy rather than external to it. And, and, and so once again, our ability to deal with a problem is hampered by our misunderstanding of that problem, our overstatement of that problem, and our reductive and simplistic approach to, to that problem. And that in itself becomes a threat to trust and security. Well, I, I, a couple of things. What, what, one building on what, what I've just been talking about, um, we, we included within the scope of our study, um, it's not just disinformation practices, but concepts of disinformation approaches to disinformation. So we are beginning to study the, um, uh, the logics, the apparatuses, the methods 
and the assumptions behind the work or underpinning the work of counter-disinformation units, of which there are many, uh, and then new ones are appearing by the day. Um, but we have done a preliminary analysis of four of the leading counter-disinformation units um, to discover that, 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 that there are deep flaws in the way they go about their, uh, their, their missions. Uh, all of them, some worse than others, but all of them share a, 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 a number of problems, um, including uh, a sort of bifurcated, contradictory approach to, uh, to truth. So they seem, many of them, to assume on the one hand that disinformation can be countered by simple fact-checking, that what we need is to ramp up fact-checking, verification, and that if we do enough of that, uh, then audiences will kind of intuit uh, how to do their own research and check whether something is true or false. Um, and yet, on the other hand, um, they're aware that um, disinformation also takes the form of an attack on values, um, uh, and, 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 and uh, um, a challenge to the kind of moral assumptions underpinning democracy. Um, so that, that's, that's truth of a very different kind, and you can't fact-check that second kind of truth um, any more than you can get at the kind of uh, uh, challenging of, 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 um, uh, uh, of values by simple fact-checking. Um, so um, What, 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 what is happening is, is that there is a, um, a, a sort of assumptions about the, the value of rational scientific observation measurement on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand there's this kind of moral mission to promote democracy often by part civic participation. So a lot of these uh, counter-disinformation units, they pride themselves on involving ordinary citizens. Um, because we're democracies, we involve our citizens in everything we do. And we invite our citizens to reinforce our values by showing that ordinary people can themselves kind of contribute to the counter-disinformation effort and thereby defend democracy. The two principles, that of rational, empirical, scientific analysis carried out by trained experts, and that of the civic kind of engagement of citizens in unpicking disinformation, the two of them are at the very least in tension, and at the very worst they're in conflict. And yet all of these counter disinformation units try to marry these two disparate approaches, um, uh, often uh, resulting in, in, in uh, incoherence and, um, and a form of analysis that, 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 that falls apart at, 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 uh, under scrutiny. And we um, um, have done some specific empirical work uh, already. Uh, you know, the project started just a few months ago, a couple of months ago, so very recent. Um, but we have done uh, together um, some work on uh, Russian disinformation uh, and disinformation which included clearly fabricated sort of co content in the context of the war in Ukraine and um, particularly narratives uh, which were aimed at domestic uh, Russian audiences um, where the kind of uptake trust towards official uh, position was high. And what we um, kind of saw uh, from the material we analyzed, mostly through arts and humanities research of close reading, um, that um, these reports which contained clear disinformation as fabricated content uh, worked at the level of specific narratives. And if the framing of a narrative sounds plausible to the audience because it links to particular 
kind of uh, long ingrained cultural perceptions or historical perception, then they might have a resonance. And so in that context, we developed a five-stage model of studying uh, a disinformation, a history, uh, a life cycle, we called it, of disinformation narrative. Um, and, uh, and the first one, how a particular story uh, is framed in such ways that it uh, kind of appears true. So what kind of evidence is uh, cited to um, kind of uh, increase the truth status uh, of a story? Then how a particular story changes over time when specific context in which it is di disseminated changes how uh, a certain story is adapted by disinformation providers to different lingua cultural contexts, how the story is uh, developed and disseminated by uh, collaboration between actors across geopolitical boundaries. That is a very important kind of part of our uh, project. So we focus on Russian or Soviet disinformation, but a lot of stories which uh, authoritarian disinformation providers pick up and disseminate sometimes originate uh, in, within democracies. And we have plenty of disinformation providers within democracies, particularly the United States. And uh, again, we look, our model suggests how to look at collaborations between these different disinformation providers. Uh, and finally, uh, as Stephen mentioned, some of the uh, counter-disinformation units' practices are questionable, and they themselves produce uh, kind of counter-disinformation reports, uh, the quality of which uh, can be critiqued. And uh, an interesting part of our research is to see how disinformation providers, those who are accused of disinformation, use the shortcomings in the work of content disinformation unit to bolster their positions. So, uh, and we are about to publish an article putting forward this model of studying disinformation narratives at five different levels. Well, hopefully our previous answers have given a hint at the, uh, the new perspectives that, that um, the kind of expertise that we represent can bring. Uh, as I think I said right at the very beginning, for understandable reasons, this whole area of study has hitherto tended to be dominated by expertise derived from the social sciences um, and from computing sciences. Um, and, and we, just to kind of um, clarify, we're, 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 we're not setting out to disrupt the, uh, the whole field. We, 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 we respect and recognize and use and value the kind of work that those models can, can do. But they, they have their limitations. They, they are very, very good at identifying and categorizing big, broad trends. Um, they're much, much less good at um, kind of close, fine-tuned analysis of the kinds of distinctions and shifts and changes that, 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 that we've been talking through. Moreover, they, 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 they deal, and they have to deal, because it's inherent to, to the way they're set up, they have to deal in data and content. They measure data and they organize content. Um, and that, you know, that can be a useful exercise. But what we're interested in, and what I think as humanities scholars we can bring, is a focus on meaning. Meaning can't be measured. Um, it can be interpreted, it can be analyzed, it can't be measured. Meaning is not data, meaning is not fixed content that exists as a, as a thing. Meaning is something that is navigated and negotiated between human beings across languages, across cultures, across times. Um, 
And this, this is why the, the very term disinformation is in a way unhelpful. You know, disinformation, etymology, it's telling you that it's the, not the opposite of information. So there's information and there's not information. What we're interested in is, is, is meaning. Um, and um, the kinds of tools that we bring, looking at the, how narratives have developed and changed over his, through history, um, looking at very closely at the way texts that we count as disinformation are put together, how they work rhetorically, um, looking at how audiences as groups of individual people make sense and make different sense of these narratives through qualitative field work that relies on, you know, uh, very, very detailed kind of conversations of the sort we're having now, one-to-one. -one. That's the sort of expertise that, that, that we can bring, as, as well as on our team, we have, we have a very good translation studies specialist uh, who understands and can show the workings of how uh, texts are translated across languages and across cultures, what happens to them. Um, those are the kinds of of, 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 of knowledge that, that, that can really bring a new perspective on, 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 on this topic. Um, my own origins as a, as a literary scholar um, I, I think are helpful because I was trained to, um, to, to look at narratives and, and how they're structured, how they are narrated, uh, how they're plotted, how those plots work as narratives. Um, None of that can be done by these big computer-driven uh, models of measurement, which have their place, um, but which have come to dominate the entire discipline. And, 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 and we hope and believe that we can, we can take it to a new level precisely by um, bringing to bear the, 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 these humanities-driven Focus, uh, perspectives on meaning, its generation, um, its consumption, and the way that it travels and changes across time and across the borders that we've described. Just a small point, because uh, Stephen already has given a very comprehensive answer, that um, there is a complex relationship between concepts and phenomenon that, uh, that the concept is supposed to explain. Uh, and uh, the concept uh, can be used very productively uh, because it can kind of capture the essence of the phenomenon, but uh, concepts can also work reductively. Mm. Uh, and throughout the project, we will be interrogating over time, from the Cold War to the present, uh, the meanings of uh, the concept of disinformation and related concepts. And by kind of seeing how the meaning of specific concepts, disinformation, propaganda, fake news, uh, has changed over time, we can perfect their application to study of specific phenomena. And uh, I will be using um, the myth methodology of intellectual history, which is arts and humanities methodology, to interrogate the changing meanings of these key concepts. And indeed the history of the application of these concepts, which again can help us to perfect the application today. And just, just, just to give one very concrete, small example of what Pierre is talking about, We've done doing a little bit of work around certain disinformation narratives. If you take, for example, deep state, uh, this idea that there's a kind of hidden set of forces operating behind the scenes within states to undermine them and to serve the interests of, um, of, of hidden elites. It, it, it's something that Donald Trump has, has kind of put his own stamp on. And, and has now, is now often listed as one of the key disinformation narratives, the narrative of deep, deep state. 
First of all, um, if you look at the history of the uses of the term deep state, you'll find that people like Tony Blair have used it, Emmanuel Macron, um, and um, there was even a Radio 4 program in 2018 looking with all seriousness about uh, at, at what the deep state is and why it matters. It's only relatively recently that it's become a tainted with, the, with this notion of disinformation. Moreover, um, if you're going to kind of measure examples of deep state narratives and you do a search with the terms deep state, in certain domains you will find very, very little. For example, in the Russian domain you'll, you'll find very, very few examples of texts including reference to deep state. However, the concept of deep state, and this is what Pierre was describing, is very much something that is at work in Russian propaganda and, and, and actually beyond Russian propaganda. Um, so that distinction is, as Vera says, that's very important, but so too is this need to trace the historical usages of terms and how their status disinformation to not disinformation, sometimes to again disinformation, changes. Just that we, um, as well as ourselves, um, we, uh, we have a quite a big team mm -hmm. of colleagues. Um, uh, the translation studies specialist I mentioned is based in Leeds. The audience research specialist, very good audience research specialist, is, is in Loughborough. We're, we're, we're also, we have an excellent new postdoctoral researcher uh, from Moldova. Yeah. Um, but we're also working with the um, policy think tank, Chatham House. So we're hoping that they can facilitate sort of um, the attention of policy makers to our, to our project. We're working with a representative of one of the very counter disinformation units that we've been critiquing. So it's a two-way dialogue. It's not just us having a go at them. They, they too will be able to kind of critique and, 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 and comment on, on our work. And we also, um, we're, we're also going to have the involvement of a, of, of a quite a senior Ofcom executive because they have a very sort of strong interest in media literacy and disinformation in, and, and, and indeed uh, digital trust um, in, in that context. So it's, it's, it's a, not only a multidisciplinary, but it's a multi-institutional, multi-sector project.